final study, at least in this format, on redigging the wells. Isaac had to redig the wells that his father Abraham had dug to feed the uh, the animals, to feed the the sheep and the and the cattle, and the uh, to to uh, water the crops. The Philistines had come in and stopped them up, so Isaac had to go back in and redig the wells. And every generation, you know, that has to redig the wells of their doctrine, of their understanding, because none of us get to heaven on Mama's coattails or Grandpa's. Um, coattails. We have to have an experience with God ourselves. So we're redigging the wells, and kind of our theme verse has been, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. God can be experienced, and the Pentecostal message is that God is not just for your head. He's for your heart, your emotions, your body. You can experience the presence and the power of God. Now, tonight I want to take you to um, this scripture. Listen to this. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, let me, not a trick question. I'll help you with this, but uh, I think you know where I'm going. Who did God give these gifts to? Who did Christ give these church gifts? It just, just gave you the answer. I wouldn't be a very good professor. God gave these gifts to the church. Right, I just told you that. Thank you. Um, God gave these gifts to the church, and we believe to the Pentecostal church, to the tongue-talking church, to the spirit-filled church, because that's what the church was in the early century, in the first century. They were laying hands on the sick. They were prophesying. One of my books... Um, in the study that I've done, had some powerful quotes, and I want to share this with you to encourage you about the church that Christ is building. Look at this. The local church is prophetic in function. Everybody say prophetic. It testifies to the world by the inspiration of the Spirit. The preaching of the Scripture through the prophetic anointing of the Spirit enables grace and a revelatory encounter with God. That's what prophetic preaching is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring us face-to-face with the presence of God. The church community is to speak forth the Word of God for today. Thus, she must not lose her prophetic function to live and testify to social and political issues. The local churches must allow for the prophetic gifts to express the justice of the Lord to both the church and to the nations. Now, oh, 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 you get this. She, that is the church, she lives as a protesting society to the demonic powers and unjust structures in the world. We're here to be a protest movement, a countercultural movement against the demonic powers and unjust structures in the world. Now, these three quotes I'm giving you, that's the first one. It's all from Dr. Kenneth Archer, a wonderful Church of God theologian and speaker. The church lives as a protesting society to the demonic powers and unjust structures in this world. So when you think of Revive, you think of our ministry, our outreaches, our church services, our prayer meetings, are we living as a protesting society to the demonic powers and unjust structures in the world? We are not called to be quiet and silent. We are not called to sing louder as the um, trains go to the concentration camps. We are called to speak. And we are not called to to be tasteless and dim. We are called to be salt and light. Amen? We are called to make a difference. Let's go on. Dr. Archer says, The church is an empowered missionary community because it is charismatic, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Charismatic or charisma simply means gift-oriented. We believe in the gifts. We operate in the gifts. God has given us gifts. Christ has given us gifts. We are a gift church, so therefore we are a charismatic church, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as such, it is anointed like Christ to perform signs and wonders for the coming kingdom of God. 
We believe the kingdom is here, is within us, and the kingdom is also not yet. It is coming. So there's a dual focus on the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within us. We are subjects of the king. Amen? We're under his rule and reign. He has dominion in our lives. So we're, he's the king. We're the king's kids. We're part of the kingdom. And we're also praying for thy kingdom to come and thy will to be done. So we perform signs and wonders for the coming of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, greater works than these will you do because I send the promise of the Spirit to you. How do we do greater works? By operating in the Spirit, by walking in the Spirit, by living in the Spirit, by functioning in the Spirit, by manifesting the kingdom dynamic of what it means to be spiritual beings living a human existence, not the other way around. Finally, Dr. Archer says, the local church is a community of prophets. Turn to someone and say, hello, prophet. Hello, prophet. The local church is a community of prophets. It functions pastorally. Look at this. It functions pastorally. As a healing community, the church nurtures the brokenhearted. Did you hear what Elizabeth said a few moments ago? What this healing room is about. She sets captives free. The church is a foretaste of the healing that is still to come in full. Hallelujah. I want to share with you somewhat of a paper that, that my last paper on this course that I, that I submitted, and I've made some good marks, praise the Lord. Um, I've made a few hundreds, hallelujah. And um, on four of the papers I made 100%. I didn't even know you could make 100% on a paper. But I was talking to my son about it, and I explained to my son that I believe the reason might be the professor's just thrilled with my grammar and my spelling because in this class that I'm taking, there's a man from India, a man from Norway, a man from China, and a man from um, Africa. All of those, English is their second or third language. So my, lang my he's probably like just delighted to, oh, I can, this is easy to read. <laughs> compared to, you know, compared to. So uh, anyhow, got a few good marks, but I, this one hasn't been marked yet. But I want to share with you the passion that has arisen in my heart from taking this course. This course has nothing, been nothing less than a kind of a spiritual revival for me, a refreshing, a restoration, and a return to my roots. Remember, I was raised in Pentecost. My great-great-grandparents were in Pentecost. So for me to be refreshed, you know, something supernatural was happening. And among the things that were happening is I now have a much broader understanding of the rich spiritual heritage we have and a much greater appreciation for the holiness revival movement which birthed much of the Pentecostal revival. As you study what was going on in America in the, in the decades leading up to the Pentecostal revival of Azusa Street, there were supernatural stirrings. There were camp meetings that came out of the, the Cane Ridge Revival. Oh, what God did in 1801 in Kentucky when 20,000 people showed up in a week. 10% of the Kentucky state population came during that week to see what God was doing. People were being slain in the Spirit, prophesying. There was preaching and, and ministering going on 24 hours a day, all day and all night. They brought out torches so they could see the preacher at night. It was supernatural what was going on in Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801. hundred years later, in Kansas City, the Holy Spirit was poured out. In, 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 was it Topeka or Kansas? Topeka, I think. Anyhow, in Kansas. Topeka, thank you. And then in Kansas, and the rest is history, as they say. But I've noticed a much deeper level of spiritual hunger in my own life. I hope you've noticed it too. hope you've sensed it. I've got an increased hunger for the power of God to heal and to deliver and an increased passion for the lost. When you study the lives of the early Pentecostal pioneers, these men and women who were desperate for God, you see that they just would not take no for an answer. They said, God, you've got to move in revival fire. And that stirs me up to believe that God can do it for this generation, in this church, in my own life and ministry. Now, I've always been a strong preacher on end times, 
on end time prophecies, on eschatology is the, is the um, theological term. The signs that we are in the end of the age. The signs that Christ could return any moment now. Younger in my ministry, I did a lot of traveling. Valerie and I did with Hal Lindsey and uh, some other wonderful Bible teachers. And we, we spoke at conferences. And, and one, of my, one of my messages that there, I was always asked to preach was entitled, Hold Your Fork. Have you heard that story? I preached upon the best is yet to come, that the glory of God that is coming is greater than anything you've known. And I told the story of the, the lady that was dying, and she said to the preacher, please, please make sure when, when, um, <clears throat> when I die, you put a, a fork in my hand. And when people come by the casket, they'll see a fork in my hand. And, and he said, why? She told him, and he said, okay, we'll do that, and I'll tell the people at the funeral. And they did, and everybody, why is she holding a fork? And as the pe- people came by, they, why is she holding a fork? And the pastor said, let me tell you why she's holding a fork. She wanted me to tell you this. All of her life, she's been coming to church suppers and enjoying the salads and the jello desserts and, and, and everything and all the, ma- the macaroni, the pastas, the, the beef and the ham, enjoyed it all. But when the, when the servers would come by and pick up the plates and they said, hold your fork, <laughs> hang on to your fork, she knew there was pie or cake coming. <laughs> the best was yet to come. And she wants you to know today that though she has died, the best is ahead of her. The best is before her. She's holding her fork because the glory of God is now going to be upon her. And I preach that in, in, uh, to crowds of thousands in Dallas and Los Angeles and in Florida and some wonderful, wonderful prophetic conferences. I've always believed that we are closer today. I believe we're closer today to the return of Christ than we were yesterday. And if he tarries another day, we'll be that much closer. But I didn't realize that the Pentecostal outpouring at Azusa Street was, was so tightly tied to an eschatology. These people believe that Jesus could literally come next week. And they said, God, if you're coming back, if your son is coming back, We've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got to have the same power that the church was birthed in. We've got to have the same anointing that you promised that raised you from the dead so that we can win the loss because you're coming back soon. And I'm saying, if we're living this much closer, Israel was not even returned to the land in 1906. That was 1948. Computer technology was not available. They could barely talk across town to each other. Now we are ready for the return of Christ. And in this hour, this moment, this day, this generation, 2016, we need more power from God than they needed back in 1906. The world is more viciously, violently anti-Christ. Governments, politics, mocking reality, mocking truth. We need the power that raised Jesus from the dead in our church and in our lives. Can somebody say amen? So, the anointing we're looking for is an eschatological, end times, prophetic anointing. And I can only teach what I've experienced. I can only share what I own. Can, can I share with you something of melodies? No. Can, can, can I share with you something that, that Brenda owns? No, that's not mine. I can only share with you what I own, right? So I'm saying, God, give me more so that I have more to share. Can you say amen? You can pray the same prayer. I can only deliver what I possess myself. Now, I did talk about this last night, but it, or last week, it bears repetition. I was blown away by the revelation that I got in, in studying these wonderful teachings that they believed back in Azusa Street in 1906 that the revival and outpouring and baptism they're receiving was a baptism of love. Everybody say love. They believed it was a baptism of love. They, they wrote to each other. They published reports, reports and books about it. We've received a baptism of divine love. We've received a baptism of heavenly love. So if anything about my Pentecost makes me less loving or not as loving, there's something wrong with what I got. Mm. The humility, the love, and the unity brought refreshing to my hard as I studied all of the power we have, all of the influence, all of the personality we have, 
all the authority we have, like the Apostle Paul says, means nothing if I'm not operating out of love. It was a revelation to me that these preachers, these men and women of God, repeatedly, over and over again, said, this is about the love of God. It's all about love. Love for God, love for the family of God, and love for the lost. Can you say amen? And that is biblical, isn't it? Isn't that what Jesus said would be the mark how they'll know you're my disciples? So if he's sending his spirit, it'll make us more like Jesus and more in line with what he wants us to be and to do. Now, what I want to share with you as, as we close up tonight is, is a remarkable discovery I made in um, one, of the, one of the great teachings. It'll take a few minutes to develop it, but I, I want you to see it because I think you're going to be hearing more of it in this church. In, in one of the books that, that I was required to study and report on and write, discovered this wonderful teaching. Now, I've always been taught and practiced a fourfold gospel. That's what the Assemblies of God teaches. Um, that's what the Foursquare Gospel teaches. Um, Amy Semper McPherson started the Foursquare Gospel. And tremendous ministry and tremendous truth comes out of this that many of you will know this. That's how we were raised, that Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Baptizer. You know this. Jesus is Healer. And Jesus is Soon Coming King. You knew that. You knew you knew that. You just forgot you knew that. The, that's the fourfold gospel. The, the Jesus is our Savior. It's all about Jesus, right? Jesus is our Savior. He's our baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He's our healer, and he's our soon-coming king. That is what the Assemblies of God is known for and what the Four Square Gospel is known for. But other wonderful denominations, other wonderful Pentecostal, Spirit-filled denominations have a five-fold gospel. And the reason for that is because we come out of the holiness movement where we believed the holiness movement, the Wesleyans and Methodists in the 1800s, believed that there was a second experience after salvation, a second or a subsequent experience after conversion. And it was not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It was a, it was a um, moment of sanctification, a supernatural moment where before you were not sanctified, and now you are sanctified. In other words, made so much like Jesus that you'd probably never sin again. Now, there's a powerful point. We've got to make a decision as a Christian, as a believer, that I'm going to live for God come what may. I'm going to serve God come what may. But Pentecostals have not really, um, at least Assemblies of God and Foursquare and others, have not really looked at this as a part of the of the process, we believe that we are saved and set apart when we're born again, but that sanctification is ongoing, that I should be becoming more like Jesus every day. I can make decisions that really move me a lot further. I can take baby steps for the rest of my life, and others seem to take giant steps because they, they want to be sanctified. They want to be, be sold out to God. But understand that other denominations other wonderful Pentecostal uh, denominations that, that we love and appreciate, and I would have them preach in this church, some of them believe in a fivefold gospel. And what they mean is this. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Sanctifier. Jesus is Baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is um, Healer. And Jesus is Soon Coming King. So they add that second step in there. Now, that doesn't bother me, and I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is our sanctifier. He is the one who separates us and makes us holy and pulls us apart, and he draws us. So Jesus, by the power of his Holy Spirit, makes us more like himself, and the Spirit comes to make us more like Jesus. So I just want to show you, and, and this, this will bless you, I think, in a moment, but I have to give you that kind of background, that um, traditionally, the Assemblies of God teaching or theology says we have the fourfold gospel. Jesus is Savior, baptizer in the Holy Spirit, healer of our bodies, mind, soul, and spirit, and our soon coming King. Other Pentecostal denominations add the second part in there, sanctifier. Now, I'm going to go back to my notes. I want to get to, want to make, make myself very clear here. Other denominations, when they talk about sanctification, 
they talk about foot washing as a part of their, of their evangelical experience, and some teach it actually as an ordinance. In other words, something that Christ has called us to do in obedience to him. Now, I have never been comfortable with that stance, and I'm still not. In fact, I've always taught against the idea of the observance of foot washing as an ordinance, as I don't believe that's what Jesus was teaching at all. He said, he said I'm washing your feet, and I want you to do the same. That does not mean I do not believe that Jesus meant that we've got to always be washing each other's feet. I believe he was teaching humble service and caring for one another. I've seen too many foot washing services go wrong with little lasting impact. I've been in foot washing services where people are washing each other's feet and then go out in the parking lot and fight with each other. Something was, something was missed there. I have been personally involved getting my hands wet and getting my feet washed and washing others' feet one time in my life, and that was three years ago in China. And I'll tell you, it was a deeply spiritual and godly moment. It meant something to me and to them. But I'm not sure we'll ever have a foot washing service in this church. I don't think we'll ever need one. But, I've <laughs> but I do encourage humble, servant-hearted, caring for one another. What Jesus was saying was, mow someone's lawn. Clean someone's toilet. Go clean someone's house. Uh, Wash someone's car. Do something to love and to serve somebody. That's what Jesus was saying. That's precisely what he was saying. And all we'd love it to be about just washing feet because then Jesus wouldn't be meddling. <laughs> we just do this five times a year and feel all spiritual. I don't believe for a minute that Jesus was saying you need to wash one another's feet. I believe what he was saying was you need to love each other and take care of each other and even get dirty if you have to. When someone's sick, visit them in the hospital. When someone's in prison, go and see them. When someone's hungry, feed them. Get involved in people's lives. Serve one another. Now, could I stay here the rest of tonight and next Wednesday and the next Wednesday talking to you about how much Jesus told us to serve one another? Oh, of course I could. That's all through the Scripture. It was, it was Jesus' mode. I didn't come to serve. I didn't come to be served, Jesus said, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. Uh, he called us servants, and he said, well done one day, good and faithful servant, he'll say to us. So I give all of that to you to, to share with you this, this exciting, this exciting um, correlation that we can bring to the gospel here. Rereading the fivefold gospel as a paradigm for Pentecostal ministry is very exciting. And you'll see this in a moment, but I love how the writer has made a connection between the fivefold ministry gifts. What are they? The apostle, the evangelist, prophet, pastor, and teacher. He's connected them to the fivefold gospel. I need to tell you that I'll be using this model or this paradigm as a, as a, as a model. Uh, as a pattern for our ministry here. But I'll be changing the sacrament of foot washing for loving, humble service. Okay? I can certainly relate to the connection of the healing ministry to the pastoral function. A pastor wants to heal hearts and souls. A pastor wants to heal minds and bodies and relationships. A pastor wants to heal a community and to heal all manner of hurts and wounds and brokenness. Now would be a good time, but we've got to help. Um, we could pass out these notes in just another five or ten minutes uh, right there for everybody to get one. Thank you. And turn to the bottom when you get it of page four. I uh, took out two or three pages, deleted a lot of stuff that wasn't pertinent to what we do tonight, but uh, this is uh, the bulk of the paper that I uh, submitted. So turn to page four.
Ryan, if you could run a couple up to Kyle and and anybody else up there. And Tom, two uh, two upstairs, yeah. Okay, everybody find the bottom of page four. It starts um, two-thirds of the way down. Jesus is Savior. Can you find that? Okay. Jesus is Savior. Let's go through this now and make the correlations that this writer has done. Jesus is Savior. The church is redeemed community and the ordinance of water baptism as a sign, and this is the apostolic function. The apostolic function is the establishment of the church, taking the gospel to new areas, to new places it's never been before. Jesus is Savior. And here we see the church as a redeemed community and the ordinance of water baptism as a sign, the apostolic function. Here we, then, then we have Jesus as sanctifier, the church as holy community and loving service as the sign. See, the sign that you're receiving Christ as Savior is you're baptized in water. Amen? That's, that's a sacrament. That's an ordinance. The sign that you're a holy community is a loving service, and this incorporates the teaching function. Why do we need to be taught? We need to be taught to be humble, be taught to be servants, to be, to be taught to be loving, to be taught to be holy. To be, we need to be taught to be, live a sanctified life, that's why the teaching function is there. Then Jesus is spirit baptizer. Somebody say hallelujah. The church is a gifted or charismatic community. And the sign glossolalia, that means speaking in tongues, a language you've never learned. And this is prophets in the charismatic or gifted function. Prophets prophesying the blessing of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of God to build his kingdom. Then Jesus is healer. The church as a healing community, the sign being praying for the sick and laying on of hands. And here, he says, is the pastoral function, preaching and teaching and ministering healing for mind, body, soul, and spirit. And I love that. I've said, well, I'll tell you, on my wedding day, the preacher, still alive, wonderful man of God, he laid his hands on Valerie and I, and he prophesied that we'd have a ministry of power and healing. And I have known that to some degree, but not to the degree that God wants to release it. So I'm taking this on, this mantle on, as a healing ministry. The pastoral function, the church as a healing community, the sign of praying for the sick and laying on of hands, and that is the pastoral function. Can somebody say glory to God? (laughs) Jesus is coming king. The church as missionary community with the Lord's Supper as the sign. Think of this. Jesus established this sign, didn't he? We're going to have the Lord's Supper on Sunday. And we will remind you again that Jesus said, Do this till I come again. Do this till I come again. Eat this supper. Drink this, drink this emblem of my shed blood. Drink, eat this emblem of my body. Do this until I come again. I'm going to interrupt one of these, Lord, uh, these, these Passovers. I'm going to interrupt one of your worship times. I'm going to come again. Split the eastern skies, and that is the evangelistic function. Why do we put the evangelistic? Well, let me, let me go on because uh, I want to wrap up. How does this look in practical ministry? What does this mean for revive? Well, Jesus is Savior. We want to reach the lost, amen, the backslider, and those who have never heard. We are not living in a culture where we can assume that everybody knows the gospel anymore. You cannot assume that your neighbors know the gospel. They may not. We've got to reach them. Jesus is sanctifier. We teach the believer to be separated from the world, separated from the flesh, separated from just their personal feelings, and made holy or sanctified. What for? For loving service. The Bible says that we were created for good works, for loving service. Then Jesus is baptizer. We receive power to prophesy or not to do witnessing, catch this, but to be a witness. Now, um, chefs cook, right? Do chefs cook? Yes. Do I cook? Does that make me a chef? No. 
Of course not. Um, do mechanics fix cars? Yes, right. Can I fix some things about a car? Yes. I can change a flat tire. Come on. But the, So I can fix some things about a car, right? Does that make me a mechanic? No, of course not. I'm going somewhere. Um, do arborists um, take care of trees and cut? Yes, okay. Can I cut down a tree? Does that make me an arborist? No, of course not. Jesus did not say you will do some witnessing. Catch this. He said you will be my witness. You will be a witness. Witnesses witness. Witnesses share. Witnesses testify. Now, some Christians tell a story. Some Christians share the gospel. Many Christians don't. That's why we need the power. Because Jesus said when you receive the power, you will become a witness. Someone going to get this? The power of the Holy Spirit comes to make us a witness, not to give us authority or the ability to do some witnessing now and then, but to be a living witness. Oh, bless God. That's why I want the power. The more anointing that I become the witness that Christ wants me to be. Uh, where were we? Jesus is mm, baptizer. We receive the power of the Holy Spirit to prophesy, to be a witness. Jesus is healer. We minister recovery, restoration, and rest to the weary and wounded. Don't you love what I shared last week about spirit-filled, charismatic churches? We're not judging the world. We're inviting the world into a healing lifestyle. We're not condemning the world. We're inviting them to a place where they can find hope and recovery and rest for the weariness. Jesus is healer. What does this mean practically for the church? It means healing rooms. It means prayer times on Sunday mornings. It means, lay, it means laying hands on the sick. It means ministering, blessing. And Jesus is coming king. Jesus is coming king. Think of what that message means. Think of it as a believer. Jesus is coming soon. What does that do for you? It gives you hope, right? And it purifies you. <laughs> Jesus is coming tonight. I will be especially careful what I watch on television. I'll be especially careful how I treat the wife. Jesus is coming tonight. What if we knew that? For us, it's hope. It's life. It's comfort. It's joy. We say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And the spirit and bride say, come, Lord. But for the world... It's horror. It's warning. It's judgment. It's darkness. So the same message, and that's why I believe that this writer put it on uh, the evangelist, that the eschatological discussion, the end times discussion, Jesus is coming again, is an evangelistic message because in it we warn the world and we wake up the church. Now, as you can see in the notes there. Although this model or paradigm for Pentecostal ministry is not perfect and is not exactly biblical and it's not inspired, but it is inspiring, okay? It's taken from Scripture, but it's not a pattern that the Lord said you've got to think about it in this way. It's just a way for us to structure and to think about our ministry. But it has enough biblical basis and enough structure that I want to develop it further in my life and ministry, and here at Revive. So who is Jesus to us? He's Savior. He's Sanctifier. He's the Baptizer. He's the Healer. He's the Coming King. Can you say praise God? Oh, that blessed me. Stirred up in my spirit about the anointing that's available for us to do ministry and to be ministers in this last hour before Christ returns. Any questions about what we've talked about? Any uh, comments or, uh, or um, thoughts about what we've shared the last few weeks or tonight. Was that fourfold gospel or fivefold gospel new to most of you? New to most of you? Okay. 
You were, you were born AG. Oh, the, the fourfold you had. Oh, yeah, okay. Good. good, good. Well, you'll hear some more of that. We'll put on a slide for you. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Father, we worship you tonight. We thank you for the anointing that's available, the anointing that's available for a church service or for a prayer service, the anointing that's available as we drive to work tomorrow morning, Lord, with all the challenges and, and the hills and the valleys we'll have to climb tomorrow, Lord, that we have your presence there with us for our marriages, Lord, to, to continue to bless our children and our grandchildren, Lord, your presence and your power and your anointing to reveal yourself in us, O oh God, and then for you to speak through us with that prophetic anointing. God, we speak your blessing over these, uh, these connect groups that are beginning to meet next Wednesday, Lord. May they grow in fire and fellowship and fervor, Lord. May they grow in, in, uh, in your grace. And may, Lord, there be opportunities for people to share their hearts and their concerns and their burdens with one another so that we can pray for one another and be healed and be, and be touched by your anointing. We give this church to you, Lord. May you be the paradigm. May you be the model for ministry. May your Holy Spirit, O God, continue to stir us to pray and to fast and to intercede, to love one another and to love the lost so that your kingdom comes and your will is done.